guys Bam. right in the corner of the mouth he wouldn't go nowhere howdy guys Kel Kellogg here look at this I brought this along to illustrate a point this is one of my absolute favorite tools this is an Italian hand forged hand axe um, the ergonomics on it are absolutely fantastic um, it, it's just a beautiful piece of workmanship it come with this nice leather scabbard for the for the blade I'll put that back on there before I cut my finger, but that is just a phenomenal beautiful tool I love using it. I love the way it feels in my hand But I got a question for you if you needed a brake job on your car Would you want me to attempt to do the brake job with this hand axe? Probably not if you wanted your kitchen cabinets, you know, refaced and redone, would you like me to do that with my with my Italian hand axe? Probably not the right tool for the job. And uh, what I want to talk about today is some of the mistakes that I see trout anglers making out on the water that I hear, you know, from trout anglers that they're making when they talk to me. Let me show you a couple things and I'll tell you what trout anglers like to say about these items. Let me let me put my, my beautiful Italian hand axe down for a second. Put that right there. So I'll have guys that reach out to me and they say things like this. I always pull Rapalas for trout. I always troll spoons fast, you know, speedy shiners. I, I'm, I always troll three miles an hour or more. Or this is one of my favorites right here. I always run six inch dodgers when I go trout fishing or I always run my do uh, my downrigger when I go trout fishing because you know when I get my bait way down here in deep water if I hook something it's going to be something worth hooking okay do you know what all these statements tell me and I'm not being mean I'm being real I always be real with you guys when I hear a guy make a statement like that I know that they suck at trout fishing that's what I know Okay, because they've gotten emotionally attached to their tools. Okay, if I get emotionally attached to that hand axe and try to do every chore around the house with that hand axe, probably 99% of the time, I'm going to have the wrong tool. Okay, you need to think about your tools, whether it's your rods and reels, downriggers, dodgers, Whatever it is, you need to think about your entire trout arsenal as a baseball team, all right? The manager of a baseball team can't afford to get emotionally attached to one player, okay? If you're a pitcher and you're not throwing strikes, and then when you get behind in the count, if you're, you know, you're throwing the ball up middle of the plate and they're hitting it off the wall or they're hitting it into the seats, you're ineffective. At some point, you have to lose your spot in the rotation because this team, this boat, is not going to achieve to its full potential with you in the lineup, okay? In situations where six inch Dodgers are not the best choice, in situations where running six inch Dodgers is the worst choice, if you've got every rod in the boat rigged with a six inch Dodger, guess what? You're not gonna do very well, okay? You need to look at your entire tackle box, your entire boat as a toolbox, okay? When the trout are up near the surface, let's say in the top 15 feet of the water column, using your downriggers is hurting your level of success. I've been at this a long time, guys. 
thousands and thousands and thousands of hours on the water. And I can tell you if the trout are in the top 15 feet of the water column, lead core outfishes the downrigger almost every time, every day. If the water temperature is 65 degrees or less, you can almost bet your bottom dollar on the fact that rainbow trout will be near the surface early, late, and anytime there's chop on top of the water. If you go out and the water temperature is 65 degrees and you see marks down at 40 feet, you almost always are going to have substandard results if you dump all your lures to 40 feet and drag them around on your downrigger all day because the most active trout are up near the surface. The fish that you're marking down deep, if they are indeed trout, they could be catfish, they could be spotted bass, they could be crappie, but if they are trout, they're probably in a neutral mood and they're not really willing to strike. You may get a few fish down there, but you will do much better fishing in the zone of the lake where the most active fish are at any given time, and that is near the surface if the surface is 65 degrees or less. In that situation, you don't need to be running your downriggers. It's early spring. I actually took one downrigger off my boat. If I was out just fishing for fun, I would have taken the other downrigger off the boat too, but I use one, I have one on there because some clients wanna see how to use a downrigger and I could demonstrate how to use a downrigger since my downrigger's on the boat. But in terms of fishing effectiveness, I am not utilizing a downrigger at this time because it's not the most effective way to catch fish. Let's talk about dodgers, okay? Dodgers are something you absolutely have to have. Flashers are something you absolutely have to have. They are the two most overutilized tools in most anglers' uh, arsenals, okay? I have so many guys that'll see me catch a, a trout on a fly or, or on a soft plastic or on a spoon run naked and they ask me the question, no dodger? No dodger? And I can tell from the question that they would never think of putting a trout bait in the water without a, a, a dodger rigged in front of it and you're handicapping yourself with that kind of thinking, guys. Here's where your strategy comes in with dodgers, okay? You should start off the day, I, I usually start off the day trolling fairly fast with naked lures. If you're using dodgers, you can't troll really fast. This is the maximum speed on this on this um, six inch fish eye is about 2.2 miles an hour. So you can't really fish fast. You can barely fish, you know, medium speed with a dodger. So you should start out the day fishing naked. Lots of times you never even need to put on a dodger, but maybe you're not achieving the kind of results that you think you should be. So you start slowing down. The first dodger you put on should not be a big giant dodger like this. It should be the smallest dodger in your tackle arsenal. For me, it's a mini willow leaf dodger, okay? That's my starting point. I'll start with that dodger. Now, maybe that produces results, maybe it doesn't. Maybe I think I need a little more flash and vibration. I'll move up to either my, uh, my sidewinder or my diamondback. Those were about three inches long very subtle dodgers guys remember the dodger the only the only function of the dodger most of the time is just to draw fish within you know proximity of your bait so they can see the bait they can smell the bait they can taste the bait they can eat the bait a dodger is just your calling card it's the ad in the phone book it's your business card it's just something that puts out enough flash and vibration to get those fish to drift into your spread and then evaluate your bait and the bait should you know do it from there particularly if you're trolling something like a gulp or a threaded worm behind that dodger then it's up to the bait to close the deal that's where things like pro cure fish scent come in soft plastics come in the worms the stuff like that stuff that it has the ability to catch trout that are in a neutral mood if the trout are not in a neutral mood we're going to be banging them with rapalas at three and a half four miles an hour and we don't need any dodgers at that speed 
So most of the time when you're breaking out your Dodgers, it's because the trout are in a neutral mood for whatever reason and they're not willing to chase. If they're in a neutral mood in the spring, it could be water temperature, it could be water temperature fluctuations because you get a lot of ups and downs in water temperature in, in the spring, early spring particularly, and in the fall and late fall, you get those big fluctuations in water temperature and you know that's not, not real conducive to making the fish feel real energetic. They're cold-blooded, they don't like declines in temperature. A rising temperature often stimulates the bite in the early spring, but a declining temperature doesn't do much for the bite. That's why the bite is often better after 11 o'clock rather than before. The water is cold at, you know, first thing in the morning. When the water temperature starts to climb, you see those fish become more active, more aggressive. You might start out the day using a small dodger and a worm to scratch out a few strikes, but you might end the day pulling your, sp your speedy shiners and your rapalas or, you know, a fly that you control quickly because the fish have become energized with that rising water temperature. Um, same things, I have the same f uh, philosophy with flashers. I love trolling flashers. I would troll flashers, big traditional flashers for years, uh, particularly the, the Vance's Willow Leaf flashers. Um, I trolled those for years for kokanee, kings, and trout. But the thing that I didn't like about them was just the bulk that they added to my spread. I didn't like all the drag they have. It put drag on the rod, but it also allowed the fish to develop slack between the flashers you know on the leader and it made it easier for them to shake the hook particularly the kokanee and that's one of the reasons that i came up with the turbo flasher i like to start off subtle i'm going to start off with a single turbo i might run two turbos but that's about it no drag um no you know huge amount of flash huge amount of vibration just enough high high pitched hum to pull those fish within range of the main offering. That's kind of my philosophy. So remember, we've gone over a few things here. Don't become emotionally attached to anything in your tackle box. Be prepared to break out any tool you have on any given day and attempt to build a pattern. That's why we have a variety of baits and a variety of sizes and a variety of colors. That's why we have, we carry with us a variety of fish scents. I have a few really robust scents like a bloody tuna and garlic and I have a few sweet scents like sweet corn, anise, anise krill, stuff like that. It allows me to experiment and build a pattern. Likewise with spoons and flies and soft plastics and everything else, okay? Your goal is always to build a pattern and that pattern is gonna consist of four things. Depth, speed, lure, color. Okay, if you can determine the depth of the fish, the speed they prefer, the lure they prefer, and the color they prefer, you are going to pound them. You are going to catch a maximum amount of fish. Sometimes you need to use your downriggers. Sometimes you need to use your six inch dodgers. Evaluate the, the, the situation, evaluate the conditions, evaluate the water temperature, time of the year, and then start taking the temperature of the trout and let the trout tell you what they ultimately want the most. That's how you build a pattern. That's how you become a really effective trout angler. And remember, if you want to catch big trout, the gateway to catching really big trout is catching a lot of trout. The more trout you can catch, the better chance you have of catching a really large trout. And you catch a lot of trout by effectively, quickly building a pattern. Now, the pattern may change. Let's say we're out, and I'll, I'll close on this idea. Let's say we're on a Sierra Lake. Let's say it's, it's a couple months from now, it's June. You and I are on a Sierra Lake and we're out fishing and we start off going fairly fast and we got some chop on the water and the surface temperature is 64 degrees and we're top line in a Rapala and a speed spoon and a metalhead trolling fly. And man, we are just working the fish over and it's great. But then at 10 o'clock, we lose the breeze. The sun is high now. The water gets glassy and the bite goes away. We're not catching fish on that fast stuff anymore. So 
maybe we make a change. We put out a, a threaded worm naked, no, no attractor of any kind, or maybe we use a small mini willow leaf, something like that, in one rod. And we put out a woolly booger fly on another rod. We're gonna troll that slow. Maybe a light colored one that we know they haven't seen, a white or chartreuse woolly booger. That's kind of a unique offering. And on the third rod, maybe we're using a micro trigger spoon or a wee dick knight, something like that. Get the idea, we've put on three very stealthy unintimidating baits and it's glassy and and you're eating a sandwich and i'm having a soda and we gave lucy a bone and oh man there's a little breeze now we picked up a few fish when it was glassy now wow it's really getting breezy and we're starting to see some white caps okay what do we know surface temperature is ripe for having rainbows on the surface it's 64 degrees we're getting surface chop. We're getting white caps. We see white caps. They see security. They don't feel vulnerable from over the head predators. And they also see current. Those rainbows are going to pull up into that chop. The fish are going to be one to two feet deep. They're going to be right in that rough moving water, that water that is well oxygenated, that water that makes them feel real robust and aggressive. Guess what? Get rid of the worm. Get rid of the dick night. Bust out those Rapalas, the metalheads, the speed spoons, the speedy shiners, and let's kick this boat up to three, three and a half miles an hour because I can absolutely guarantee you that hot action we seen this morning is going to be even better after lunch when the surface temperature has climbed up a little bit, the, the, the plankton, the minnows are really going, and now we got current, we got chop, we have overhead security those fish are going to be poised to go absolutely crazy and it is a situation where we want to be very very aggressive and when we start hitting fish we really want to cut the lake down to size and we want to work that area where the fish are feeding where the fish are cruising where the fish are hanging out that's how you use a pattern and that's how you evaluate the environment to kind of tell you what's going on you know, you've always got to be thinking fishing. You've got to be thinking about what the trout are doing. And then you've got to be willing to take feedback from the trout. Let them tell you what they want the most. Anyway, I'm Kel Kellogg, guys. I make these kind of videos because I want to see you have maximum success on the water. I want to help you catch more and bigger trout. Think trout fishing and let the trout tell you what they really, really want. I'm out of here for now. If you're looking for gear, if you're looking for gear that meshes with my system of trout fishing, which is large and fast to small and subtle, you know, small and slow, um, get on up to fishhuntshoot.com, fhsfishing.com, and we'll hook you up with what you need to get out on the water and be successful. And I have the number one lead core rod in the world. I put blood, sweat, and tears in developing it. Um, nothing fishes like lead core when the trout are in the top, you know, 15 feet of the water column or so. I'm Kel Kellogg. I'm out of here for now. Thanks for all the support, guys. Thanks for listening to me blabber here on YouTube day after day, week after week, year after year. I will catch you next time right here on this channel. Thanks a ton, guys. I'm Kel Kellogg.